thank you for joining me on another episode of She Leads Now podcast, where we help career and entrepreneurial women gain the tools to develop a success mindset, create winning strategies, build collaborative relationships, and take bold action towards creating impact and fulfillment in their lives and careers. I'm your host, Sabine Gideon, and I'm on a mission to awaken and activate women and emerging leaders so they can tap into their innate leadership ability, elevate their influence, and create the impact they were destined to make. If you're ready to up-level your confidence, courage, and influence, you've come to the right place. Join me weekly for insights, strategies, and resources to help you grow, develop, and embody the leader you were meant to be so that you can make the impact you know you are called to make and establish the legacy you've always dreamed. The world eagerly awaits the emergence of your brilliance, impact, and influence. So with that, let's dive into this week's episode. Welcome to another episode of She Leads Now. I'm your host, Sabine Gideon, and I am so excited to be bringing to you another installment of the Lead Hership Reloaded, Redefining, Reimagining, and Rehumanizing Leadership. And I have with me another fabulous guest here. So this is Bertine Crevacore West, and Bertine is a certified diversity executive, conflict resolution strategist, learning and development specialist, best-selling author, award-nominated podcast host, editor-in-chief of Global Fluency Magazine, and an international speaker. Her commitment to creating authentic relationships continues to drive her towards positive cultural change on a global scale. My God. With that, welcome to the show, Bertine. I am so excited to have you here. I'm delighted to be here with you today. Yes, we've been talking and probably could have recorded a good 30 minutes uh, already. So I'm, I just know that the audience is in for a treat here. So I just read the bio with all of the wins that you have gained over the course of your career. I would love for you to take us back and, and walk us through, like, what has your journey been like? How did you get to this place where you have become this fabulous change agent in this world? Oh, thank you so much for, for your kind words, really and truly. I wish it had been, the journey had been as smooth as you just described it. I started this journey I would say professionally, when I got laid off and I found out, my husband and I, that we were three months pregnant. And I thought to myself, oh, great. Who's going to hire a pregnant person, right? And needless to say, this position, I called it a job because I knew it wasn't my destiny. I, I knew it wasn't fulfilling my purpose, my life's purpose. It wasn't even fulfilling my daily purpose, right? But I did it because that's the job I had to do. And then I, I mourned the loss of it because a layoff is a loss. And I mourned the loss of it for one day, if that. So let's say less than 24 hours. And then I thought to myself, all right, this is an opportunity. What am I going to do? And so I decided to create a, what I call a self-SWOT analysis. And so I looked at my strengths, my weaknesses, my opportunities, and my threats. And sometimes our threats are internal rather than external, right? Thinking that we can't and placing limiting self-beliefs in, into, our, into our brain's presence, if you will, right? And so when I listed all of those things, I realized that the reason I was being hired for other positions in the past was because of all of these strengths. So how was I going to capitalize on that? And then too, I said to myself, I want the baby to be proud of me. But what I did want him to see was that mommy can, right? And can do anything, anything that I wanted to do. So fill in the blank, right? And that that can had to be in alignment with the type of person that I am, my work ethic, my values and my goals. And so I sought to put those things together and I put myself on this journey of becoming an interpreter. I was the first nationally certified healthcare interpreter for Haitian Creole in the state of Georgia. And so the first is great, but it's not the best thing, right? So my goal was to multiply the the level of care, linguistic and cultural care that Haitian Creole speakers could provide to other people. And then that turned into, okay, so now I'm serving people. It was a French and Haitian Creole translator as well. So now I'm serving people around the world 
but, and locally through interpretation, but that wasn't enough because I thought, okay, I'm serving two languages, but what if I could train people in the way that would make them superior interpreters, give them something I myself did not receive in my training. So that led to me creating this, this body of work that trained other interpreters. And then that extended from the state of Georgia where I live to around the country. So it was great when we decided to go virtual and do live trainings. Then that led to cultural confidence. And then my work in cultural confidence took me to honestly different heights. It took me to universities. Um, it took me to, to businesses, small, medium, and large organizations and businesses, nonprofit organizations. It took me to the pharmaceutical industry. Everywhere I wanted to go, it took me. And then I thought, there's got to be more, though, than this. So then I reimagined my company. And by that, I mean, I, I decided that the company needed to be complete, which it is now, but it needed to be in four parts. So there had to be the, the management consulting side, the business side of the company. Then there had to be the cultural competence. Then there had to be linguistic access. And so those three, those three parts, along with our government sector, those four parts made it a cohesive company because I wanted to be one-stop shopping and language, culture, and business go together, mm -hmm. right? And so what we did too was flip the, the traditional paradigm of diversity, everything. So rather than lead with diversity, I sought to lead with inclusion because when you do that, you create equitable policies, which speaks to our business minds, right? And then you automatically, when there's equity, that is a natural flow into creating belonging and community. And so then you naturally build on diversity. So that was my path. And so to that end, when the pandemic hit, I thought, okay, what am I going to do? I don't want a newsletter, right? I was like, no, what can I do that's going to engage me more? Because a newsletter was a bigger commitment to me than what I thought a magazine would be. So I decided to start a magazine. And that magazine, Global Fluency Magazine, found its way to Europe, Africa, Latin America, parts of Asia, and of course, Canada. So. It was, and I say, of course, like that's the thing that I just expected. I didn't expect anybody but two cousins to read this magazine. <laughs> so I thought to myself, instead of me waiting to be asked to be at someone's table, which is a great thing, but why not create a table and invite others to join me at this table? And so the magazine is a quarterly magazine. It's been really well received. It really started as a value add to clients mm -hmm. and to amplify the voices of people I wanted to hear from as well. But that is the sloppy, messy, fun filled roller coaster ride to my career. <laughs> like, oh, okay. I think she's Asian. I don't want to assume, but I think so. You knew from the name. Look, I've been thinking about it. Okay, I, we got to get on this in, on this interview, but I was thinking about it because. <laughs> It's not Sabine, right? It's Sabine. <laughs> Hard. And right, then right. my last name is actually Gideon, right? Mm -hmm. So the two E's have accent marks in, yeah. in real life. But I remember when I got here and started in school, the teachers, I, I don't know, they couldn't pronounce Gideon. <laughs> yeah. Let me tell you how people were trying to call me Betty. And I was like, <laughs> that is not. And one person I remember would always call me Bertha. And I was like, that is not the name my parents gave me. And you know what? It speaks to our identity, our attachment to our culture, but also, as you were mentioning, code switching and how we fit into a society, right? And people use the word assimilate a lot, which was actually coined by a long ago ancestor who was a Krepker. But assimilation isn't real cultural competence, right? We want acclimation, right? Because acclimation means that we keep our identity and then we incorporate that into the, we feed it into yeah. our adopted identity, right? Just like us having the, the the pleasure and the beauty of being Haitian, French is our adopted language, but Creole is mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. our native language, right? So French more so is the language of our head, but Creole is the language of our hearts, which is why I love both. Because without them, like, I, I'm not sure what my identity would be just from a linguistic component, right? Yeah. So it's a beautiful thing to be Haitian. Let's get our flags out. Yeah. <laughs> I was speaking to a group and I was like, 
my name may look odd to you, but think about names like Sarah and Jonathan, and then place yourself in a remote village thousands of miles away from here. Now whose name might look odd, right? So it's really important for us to understand like oddities are in the the eye of the beholder, but everybody say everybody's name, or at least everybody can try. Like that's my pet peeve when people don't try, right? Or ask. So I thank you for asking in the green room. It's really important because it lets someone know that they've been seen. Yeah. Like a good example is my son's um, elementary school teachers. Even now that he's in middle school, no teacher has ever called me by my first name ever or by my my last name, which is Crevacor West. Like that's the whole thing. But like they'll always stick to Mrs. West. And I'm just like, wow, I have a whole name that's connected to that. But they'll never, ever say it. So. I I ask people when that happens, how do you think the the person whose name you don't say is going to feel, mm. right? It's important for us to feel seen. And so they're afraid of making a mistake, but the impact is far harsher when they don't even try, yeah. right? The effect that it has upon us. So we got to we got to get good at making mistakes. Yeah. Yeah. You bring up a really great point because I feel like maybe in the last two years, because of the social uprising that happened in 2020, that there has been this now focus and this appreciation and even awareness and intentionality by most people to say, because, you know, as my name, right, it's not an easy name where they will ask the question of, I just want to make sure that I'm honoring you, or I want to make sure that I'm saying this correctly. What is it? Whereas in the past, it was just whatever, (laughs) whatever flow out of their mouth. And so I, I, I think it's, you're making a great point here in terms of when we think about DEI holistically, right? Like there's so much, it's so broad and it's always in the context of workplace, right? And what that looks like in the workplace. And essentially what I hear you doing is how does that, how does that look and feel when we're out and about, right? Like it's not, us being seen, us feeling like we belong in a particular place or have that psychological safety, that has nothing to do, that's not tied with just the workplace. It's it's how we feel day to day, going outside of our door, seeing our neighbors, going to the grocery store. And so I I thank you for bringing that up and and bringing that to light. And I want to express (laughs) the even more importance that we are being conscious and aware of people who have different names or different cultural realities and how that might show up and be being okay with being curious. It's okay to ask. It's okay to ask, how do you pronounce that? Where are you from? Tell me more. But we, we, I feel like we, we've gotten to a place or maybe before 2020, we were in a society where it maybe have, maybe the thought was it's not polite to ask or Maybe they're tired of people asking how to pronounce their name, like all these assumptions that we've made, whereas now it's like, no, 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 no. (laughs) It's better to ask than to assume. But you know what? And I love that you mentioned that, Sabine, because it is so important for us to, yes, extend people grace, but also it's not only a good thing to ask, it's a necessary thing, right? Because in cultural competence, there's, well, I'll go back a little bit. There's the golden rule, right? Do unto others as you want them to do unto you. But that's not the culturally competent rule. In cultural competence, we use what's called the platinum rule. Do unto others as they ask you to do unto them. Because we're talking about equity, right? We don't talk about equality per se, because we all don't need the same thing. We need equal access to everything. But when the thing is received, not all of us need that. Like I'm five, eight and a half without heels and I stay wearing heels. <laughs> so I might not need a step stool, but somebody else probably does if they're four, four, nine or five, two, right? Shout out to all my shorties out there, but they might need a step stool. So the, the good thing is that we both have access to a step stool. But then if we're talking about equity, they need the step stool. I don't, right? So I say, I don't need this. Somebody else does. Let me pass that on to them, right? And just that that simple example, me passing something on to them is allyship and advocacy. If I'm trying to institute rules about 
who needs this the most, right? Asking a question is advocacy so you can build allyship. Who needs this the most so I can give this to them or or we can make it so they can have that, especially if I don't need it, right? I might need something else, right? So when we take these, these concepts that are always so high level and we apply them to our everyday, they have far reaching primary impact, secondary, tertiary impact, right? I always say there are people out there that are waiting to hear our stories and share our experiences that we will never meet, but it will inspire them to not only know more, but to do better. Because once we increase, and I always say I love data, data is my jam. But like once we have more data, right, then we can filter it into information and the information leads us into insights and actionable items. My friend Aparna Ray talks about that a lot. And so when she hears this, shout out to Aparna. It's one of those things where we need to go from the theoretical, and this is where my philosophy differs. Most people, when they're talking about DEI, they talk to you about the theoretical things. This is what we shouldn't say, and this is what we we shouldn't do. But I believe first in flipping that on its head too. I believe in what we can do and what we can say rather than focus on what you can't do. Why not tell people what they can do, right? And then show them the practical steps that lead to that action being taken. Because a lot of trainings that I received, which is why I was like, I'm going to do my own thing. And so a lot of trainings that I received were talking about what you can't do, and they weren't showing you how to do anything. So that's why a lot of people, when they leave diversity trainings, like they leave in a variety of ways. So white people leave feeling guilty. Black people feel sad or angry. Latinos and indigenous people, native people, not mentioned as much. Asian people, minority modeled, right? Or model minority, Mm -hmm. right? Those are, that is not the purpose of cultural competence. It's not the purpose of inclusive allyship and inclusive leadership. So for that, I always say training is not where you start. Training is where you end. Strategy is where you start. Data is what informs your process, which leads to your strategy. So our our phrase that we've coined here is data and process equals strategy. Strategy is what is needed for a top-down effect. So once you have your strategy in place and you have your equitable policies in place, and, and, and this goes for real life as well, right? You have to create a strategy for yourself, policy, like rules of engagement for yourself, right? And then you can implement the training. That's teaching someone how to treat you, mm-hmm. right? I mean, so the things that we do in business, we can do in real life, but we have to do away with just the theoretical. We need the th- theoretical and the practical. And to do that, we have to give grace. We have to be compassionate. When I meet people and they find out that I'm Haitian, if they're not Haitian, a lot of times if I am at a speaking engagement, people, they want to connect with you as a speaker. And so they'll come up and they'll say, oh, I've been to Haiti on a mission trip. That's great. But what does that have to do with the topic that I'm talking about and my reality that you're probably not aware of because we just met, right? Mm-hmm. Um, if if you're out in an audience of like 100 of 200, however many people. So, but I have to remind myself to give them grace because this might be the 10,000th time that I've heard this, right? So, so a part of me is just, okay. And then, <laughs> this, but this is the first time that they're probably meeting well they're they're meeting me for the first time but what if i'm the first person they've met outside of haiti since their mission trip a greater conversation would lead me into talking about voluntourism and how i'm not a fan but but then we could also have conversations about the greater strategic purpose of mission trips and so to that end we have to ask people to see us as a human first and think about our human experiences right even when we're talking about our Haitianness, our Blackness. Being Black is not a monolithic experience. And so I always tell people, because I I grew up with a very firm sense of identity from my mom and from my dad's side as well. And it's that I know that as a Haitian person, that I'm Caribbean and Latin. I know that 
part of that has to do with geography. The other has to do with culture. And people often say to me, well, how are you Latin? And I'm like, not everybody looks like Sofia Vergara. Like, trust me on that one, right? And then they ask, do you speak Spanish? I'm like, that has nothing to do with being Latin, but I do. And so that's another layer of surprise, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, I feel like being African-American versus being Haitian-American, two different cultures, same race, different culture, different language, different food, different everything. It's like being Irish and Australian, right? It can be the same race, but your, your, your human experience based on your culture is totally different. So we as, as Black people also have to acknowledge the beauty of our diversity, right? And it's a beautiful thing to see, right? And so I always, I always talk about that and Pan-Africanism and what that means and how, we, how we're able to take that part and, and just cherish it and share it and, and explore, right? And then educate people about that. And then we talk about the greater diversity of different races, right? No, and no one racial group is monolithic. White people are not, Black people are not, Asians, Latin people and Hispanic people are not, Indigenous people are not, Natives are not. So it's really important for us to to think about diversity, what it really means in our real life. Yeah. And I know that was a mouthful. <laughs> no, I appreciate it. There's so many, so many takeaways there. And so I going back to the the piece that you said about like you'll do a presentation and somebody will come up to you and be like, Oh, I, I've heard about Haiti or I've been to Haiti or I've done whatever. And I think that that it almost stems from like that human desire, that human need to find like common ground, right? Like I have to find a reason to to come and speak to this person or especially when it's the DEI stuff, right? It can get very uncomfortable. It can be a little heavy. And so people, we move towards a path of least resistance. <laughs> so that could be an example of it. But one of the, the things that I love that you shared is when it comes to when it comes to anything, any initiative, and specifically diversity, right? You have to start with data, and and as with anything, we we can't fully know how much we've grown or how much we've advanced if we don't know what the starting point is, or we can't look back to to measure it. And so I remember not too long ago, I I got contacted by an organization who they were focused on. We don't have any diversity stuff in place. We want a statement, a diversity statement on our website and da, 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 right? And it was just like, oh, okay. So what does, what does your population look like today? And it was just like, we don't, we don't know. Okay. So how do you, how are you tracking? We don't have anything in place. And it was just one of those realizations. And and this is why we're in the space that we're in today. It's just like people want to put band-aid on stuff, right? It is uncomfortable. And I get it. I And I think it's uncomfortable, something that's not talked about enough, but it's uncomfortable on both sides to have to raise racial issues, right? It's never just one side is always the one raising it and the other side is uncomfortable. It's like, no, 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 we both have been or all all races, all ethnicities and all nationalities. And so when it comes into the space of like, okay, all these organizations, right? All the ones who committed money, all of the uh, performative actions and, and statements and everything in the, in the last few years, now everybody's kind of like, where's your receipts? <laughs> Where are your receipts? What have you done? And so I'm curious it based on, because you've been doing this long before the pandemic, long before George Floyd, long before all of these things, right? What are you seeing as the pitfall, right? Like the, the initial pitfalls from the company that all of a sudden it becomes woke and wants to make change to uh, the companies who once they apply it or once they create a strategy and stick to it, that they're mm-hmm. able to see huge gains. Well, I love that question so much. I love that question so much because there was this uptick in just a lot of performative measures from companies that they we're always going to assume we're going to give grace and assume that people mean to do good, right? That people don't mean to do harm and and companies don't mean to do harm. But my goal is to always align a company's intent with their impact, right? And that's where you can see that that gap is where you can see if there is a performative measure or several performative measures going on. So when George Floyd, when, when the murder of George Floyd occurred, right? I hate to say the passing because 
he didn't pass. He was taken, right? And so when the murder of George Floyd occurred, you saw a And can of I just say, fist. I'm sorry to, to cut you off. I, I think that's just a key point to put out there because I think, e- again, in this circle, right, the language that yeah. we use matters, yeah. right? It creates the impact. And so to your point, some people would be like, oh, when he died and when da 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 da. And no, like when you say murdered, that has a completely different impact. That has a completely different meaning. And it can trigger different emotions in people than if it was just like, oh, he passed away. Right. And and I love that you point that out because that is intentional on my part. I think it's really important to call things as they actually are, right? And and maybe that's just the the child of immigrants in me and and the respect that we have for language as a tool to communicate effectively with each other within our own families right but that to me and my mom was a teacher growing up so that to me back in haiti she was a teacher but that to me is really important language has power words matter right if we're talking about things that matter words matter and and that's why I I say that intentionally all the time. So thank you for acknowledging that. And so to that point, I saw a lot of companies with a raised black fist in their logo, not in their logo, but on their social media. And I'd been working with a company that had contacted me about, they were predominantly white company, but they had a lot of black students. And so I said to them, well, let's, let's look at your website. Just our very first meeting, I said, let's do a quick audit. Let's look at some of your social posts. And when I saw their social posts, I said, all right, so I see a black fist there because their their black students had been complaining that this is performative and they were right. So I said to them, what does this black fist mean to you? They're like, well, we want to honor George Floyd and also signal to our black students and it was small percentage, but all the same, they were very vocal, signal to our Black students that we're here to support them. And I'm like, but that's not what this is saying. What this is saying is there's a Black fist here. This is performative. So when you support students, what you can do is put out first a statement. We support our Black students. Say what it is, right? Say what you feel. Say say, say it in your vision and mission statements. You don't have a diversity statement on your website. And furthermore, show the data. How do you support Black students? Tell me the the population of Black students you have and what you've done to encourage them and and support them throughout their journey, what you've done to retain and recruit them as students. That is telling me that you care about your Black students. Because I know they did, but their intent did not match their impact. And that was just from an audit of their their Instagram, not even the whole rest, right? And then when we got into the weeds, I was like, all right, this website you guys have, we gotta take this out, right? But but that's an example, the data should inform us because data doesn't lie and our feelings are not facts, right? And to your point, data tells us where we've been, where we are, and it guides us into where we can and could be, right? Not even should, like I ain't using the word should because that's that that doesn't really, that's too vague for me. Where are we and where can we be, right? right. Here's a destiny. Let's work our way backwards from there. So, and when I told them that, they were admittedly blown away because I was like, it's simple, but you need to know how to do it. So first you have the theory, then you have the practical steps, right? So a lot of companies were going through this period of let's just Let's hire a bunch of Black chief diversity officers. Okay, you can have 10 fingers. That doesn't make you a concert pianist, right? So my being Black doesn't make me a good chief diversity officer. My being credentialed and experienced with a track record of success makes me a good chief diversity officer. Mm -hmm. I can come in any race, right? You, You have many diversity professionals out there of different races. So people hiring Black people, and then when they're hiring them, right, we would think that's a good thing, but then you're not setting them up with the team that they need to be successful at your company. So now you're setting up people for success, another measure of being performative. That's why strategy matters. First, think about who you're, who, what the position is, right? Then have blind resumes, right? Don't, like, in America, you don't put people's faces on, but in Europe, you do, mm-hmm. right? But have blind resumes. Don't even have people's names because there there is clear bias against using certain names. I will tell you oftentimes in the past, when I was working for other companies, 
people would meet me and I would always get this this gasp like, oh, because in their minds, what I sound like over the phone and what my name says would indicate to them that I was, a, for some reason, a petite, blonde, blue-eyed, French white woman. And I'm like, well, so when they would see me, and for people hearing the audio of this, I am the opposite of that, <laughs> right? But then and for people who are able to see us, clearly I'm not that, right? And that's neither good or bad. It just is. But your mind makes an immediate connection based on the data that you've been exposed to. Yeah. What does that tell us? So unlike a horse in Central Park, we need to expand our field of vision so we can have more data, which will inform our decisions, our perceptions, and it will remove that level of unconscious bias that, that we all have, but it can be harmful to us if we don't acknowledge it and take steps to, to mitigate it. Absolutely. So again, I think that might've been a mouthful. <laughs> no, girl, you, you're dropping gems here. Something that that you said that that sparked a memory for me. I was I was supporting this one organization, and literally they would say all the time, "We need to hire more black people." Now, mind you, at the time, like I was one of like a handful, right? And in serving in the capacity of like their their people and culture ahead, and I had the conversation with them like that that that's not a good thing, right? Like that's, it doesn't feel good for you to say that. And the fact that you're okay with saying that in front of me is a bit, is a bit alarming. And, and again, I understood the intent of where they were coming from. Right. But the impact of it was twofold, right? Now you got me thinking like, okay, well, am I, am I the token here? And then you have the the non-black people feeling like I'm not adequate. I'm not enough. I'm not all these other things. And so educating them on that. All the things. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, it was more so like I was the only one, which, which makes sense because of, of, of the role I was playing this notion of like, yeah, let's get more people of color in the door. Oh, yeah. And my thing always was, it's not enough to get them in the door. What are you doing to set them up for success? Right? Awesome. Like, this is why People will, you will get them in the door and then they'll leave in six months. They'll leave in a year. I could not get that foundational understanding to transfer <laughs> in a way where it was understood. Not that there needed to be preferential treatment, not there, there needed to be additional things in place, but, you know, there needed to be some intentionality like, okay, we're bringing these individuals in here. How are we looking at our policies? How are we looking at the way that we've created tracks for people, right? Like, what are we doing intentionally just as an em for employees overall to create this pathway for that person to be successful versus, oh, now you can see more people who look like you in the building or on Zoom or whatever the case may be. And so the the performative nature, right? We, it, to your point, it's not just in like, okay, let's let's put up more people of color on your website. It's not just let's get a statement. It's not just like that. It can it it can go down or it does go down to the very basic truth of yes, this is what you want. <laughs> Mm -hmm. But this is the impact, right? And 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 working towards finding that common ground. So as we look at this this conversation that has been opened up, I guess is a better way to put it in these last two years, and all of these systems, processes, people, policies that have been put in place to close this gap. And you've mentioned equity a couple times, and I, I just want to land on that. A little further because I do think that that is everybody everybody has a has a foundational understanding of diversity right but equity I feel like equity was like the thing that like well what is that what does that mean what is <laughs> what does that look like how do you put that into practice you gave the example earlier about like you're tall and so you don't need the step stool someone else might might need it right as we're looking at it from the perspective from diversity of, of color, of race, of ethnicity, as well as gender, right? Because we are talking about women kind of changing the game here. What does that look like? What does equity look like in practice for not just companies to put in place, but as we as women, whether we're Hispanic, Black, whatever the case may be, that we understand 
what that looks like. And we are able to self-advocate for equity in the environments that we sit in. I love that question, Sabine. I love that question. So equity looks like policies, practices, and procedures. Equity looks like rules of engagement that are codified. So no matter how small your company is, no matter how large your company is, equity looks like something codified that's going to inform our decisions on how we hire, when we hire, who we hire, where we hire, and then how we retain, who we retain, when we retain, right? And because between the hiring and the retaining, right, are we creating um, some kind of foundation upon which people can be successful? When we're talking about the issue of race, I asked a a group that I was consulting once, um, why do you want more Black people in, in your organization? Because they were so honed on Black people. I'm like, then it, it almost was compulsive, right? Mm-hmm. Um, or, or, or if I could define, if I could describe an organization as being pathological in nature, it was almost a pathology, right? And I was just like, why are you so fixated on Black people? Because it was something that they're, they're a small company. And I'm just like, why? Like, tell me why, because I wanted to make sure it wasn't about tokenism, right? If you want to serve communities, then be out in the community, be out in the community. And remember, again, we are not monolithic. We have different communities. The Ethiopian community in Minnesota is different from the Ethiopian community in New York and in Georgia, right? So you have to, this is again, why we need data, right? We need to know who is out there for us to serve. Do they want our services? right? Because they may not want your services. You may not be for that particular community. So then, and ask yourself what what your intentions are, right? Because that's that's going to inform your impact. But then when we're talking about gender, particularly as women, we also have to, to open the door to trans women, gay women. We are all in the sisterhood, right? So we have to make sure that the door is open for everyone. There's no, there's no space where we shouldn't be as a group of women. We have to make sure that all all women are empowered. All women have policies, procedures that are protecting them in the workplace. Women should be, all people should be free from discrimination, free from harassment. And this is how data will inform us who's working in our organizations, right? What type of women are working in our organizations? What is their lived experience? What is their job title? Because that also is something that we need to know. Do they feel like there's pay transparency at the organization? Do they feel as if they are supported by by management if they're not in the C-suite? Do they feel like they have the tools that they need in order to be successful, right? So we want to make sure that we support all women and we open the door to all women and the beauty of equitable policies for all women is that this also supports equitable policies for men equitable policies for non-gender conforming people all of us share this workspace and this life space and this human space together so with regard to equity equity for us is equity for all Mm, i love that i love that so many so many different layers to to die dissect there but I feel like in every in every example that you give what I love is that there is the the theory right and then there is the the practice in work environment but also the day-to-day right like it's it's almost like we're we've been given this gift as humans to learn how to be human beings again and you would think you you would think that it would be easy for us to just be like oh, okay we're just we're just gonna do like animals in their natural habitat. We're just going to do what humans do. But now it's like this unlearning of patterns and this relearning of if I'm just myself, if I'm just aware, if I come from a place of compassion and grace and curiosity, right? All of the things that we had when we were children (laughs) and somehow lost that we can be in a space where everyone exists as whoever they want to be, but also they're seen, they're heard, they're appreciated, they're acknowledged, and there's no 
superior race, if you will, or superior group over the other. So with that, we will be back next week to share thoughts and the strategies and the change efforts that she's put into place to reimagine, redefine, and rehumanize leadership. Have a wonderful rest of the day, and I will be back here with you next week. Take care. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of She Leads Now. If you found today's episode helpful or got a piece of insight that you plan to implement in your business or organization, I would love to hear from you. Connect with me on LinkedIn at Sabine Gideon, that's my handle, and send me a private message or feel free to go ahead and leave a review on either Apple or Spotify. I also invite you to share this episode with anyone in your network who you think might benefit from this content. Lastly, be sure to check the show notes and the description below for links to resources, including relevant downloads, articles, and any upcoming training. Until we chat again, have a blessed and powerful week.